just want to make an announcement as we continue this morning, just that we will have more chairs here uh, next week. So uh, if you're thinking, man, I can't go to that church, it's full, well, we're going to add some rows and chairs. We want you to get closer than ever so you can effectively pass the virus to one another. Uh, just joking. Uh, we will have more chairs. And if you do need chairs today, uh, we can pull them out the back. We do have chairs here available. So, so good to be with you. Really, really good. Uh, I love this church. Uh, just it's always great to see you every Sunday morning. Uh, I love the hellos, uh, the hugs, and uh, just what New Song Family Church is. Several years ago, I was uh, parked in an open parking lot at the mall. Uh, I'd like to park there because you don't have to pay for any kind of fees. You know, that is open parking. Love open parking. I was in a hurry. <clears throat> uh, I was buying uh, some flowers for some guests we were about to receive uh, from the airport. Uh, my parents, actually. Uh, my goal was to get home in time and then rush to drop off the flowers, put it in a nice va vase, vase and, and rush to the airport. Um, it was quick pickup. So... Um, when the security guard came to offer me his services, I just, you know, said, no, thank you, and ran. And, um, but when I got back to the car, tunnel vision, I do this. I tend to focus very much on just what I'm doing and not aware of everything around me. And so I opened the door, put the flowers in the front seat, got in the driver's seat, was backing up, and quickly glanced at my mirrors and, um, and saw the, 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 the parking guard behind my car stopping my progress. And it really irritated me. And so I hooted. Uh, for those of you listening online, I, I blew my horn and, and proceeded without regret. Uh, and, and the guard jumped out of my way, and I smashed into the back of a car. I totally, totally misunderstood the parking guard's motives. He was trying to help me, trying to save me, because while I had been inside, uh, uh, someone had come and parked their car sort of not in the parking spot where it should have been and kind of out uh, and in my blind spot and he was standing in my blind spot saying don't come back the smash up cost me money and time I barely made it to the airport to pick my parents up I listen to card guards now uh, if they're standing in the back I said thank you thank you I think if I'm honest, though, uh, I, I sometimes see God's ways and his direction as a nuisance, uh, like the parking guard, instead of um, him loving me. Uh, I, I, I treat God like this irritating parking attendant. I, I question his motives, and, and, and I misunderstand his love and miss out on, on a full and meaningful life. I don't know if, if you're like that, if you actually question uh, maybe when God does something for you, you go, you know, I, I, know you, I know you love me, but you sure have a weird way of showing it. Have you ever done that with God? Have you ever felt that way? Maybe you've said that to each other when maybe your spouse does something for you because she loves you or he loves you and you misunderstand it. I feel your love, but you sure have a weird way of showing it. The fact is, though, that living life to the fullest is our goal. We all have that goal, whether we admit it or not. And for many of us, we trust our own methodology and our ways. Uh, more than God's ways, not realizing that understanding and experiencing the love of God, uh, truly the love of Jesus is the secret and the only way to have this kind of life that we all so desperately want. We have to understand and we have to experience the love of Christ in order to, to, ex to experience this life that we so greatly desire, a full and meaningful life. This morning, I, I'm, I think you're like me in that we need inner strength to trust God. We need help to be able to place our faith in Him. The Apostle Paul prayed for inner strength uh, to trust Jesus completely and that people would understand and experience the exhaustive love of God. This is the key to experiencing the fullness of God, life. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19 I want to read this with you this morning. This is the New Living Translation, and so I'll be hopping back and forth between this translation and others just so we can fully understand the passage. I think this is probably the easiest to understand this version. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees, and we're going to get to what he's thinking about later. But he says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ, 
will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. So for a very powerful reason, which we're going to get to in just a moment, Paul is getting prostrate before the Father and praying. In the New Living Translation, it says, When I think of all this, I fall to my knees. Uh, the, the word there is really the idea uh, of, of, of dropping prostrate, in other words, flat on your stomach before God. Uh, if, if you're, if ESV would say, I bow my knees. Not that I fall to my knees, but I bow my knees. So going prostrate, going flat on your face, is that your knees are also bowing. And that's kind of the picture that we're looking at. Not that I fall to my knees, but that my knees are also bowing. I get flat out. This is what Paul was doing. Toward the end of his, he says, toward the end of his ministry, he's in prison. He probably went from prison uh, to martyrdom, prison to death. But he's chained to a Roman soldier, and he's not complaining about where he is. <clears throat> Matter of fact, he counts it a privilege to be in that kind of a location because he understands how much God loves him, by the way. And he's, he is begging God to help people place their faith in him because of what God has done in his life. He wants them to share the same kind of experience and love that he's received from the Father. So he's chained to a soldier. He's laying prostrate and he's begging God that people would have the inner strength to be able to place faith in Jesus and their lives be transformed. That's his heart. That's his passion. He says, I'm praying to the one who created all things. Look at verse 15, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. He's praying to the powerful God. He says here, the one who has unlimited power, unlimited resources. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. I want to give you just a picture of how he describes how powerful God is earlier on in his letter to the Ephesians. Look at Ephesians 1, 9 through to 23. Just I'm going to give you a perspective of who Paul is praying to. All right, so you can understand how he sees God. He says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised God, Christ from the dead, and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else. In other words, there is no one bigger than God. That's what he's saying here. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. There's never going to be a time when there's anyone greater or bigger than God. Can we say hallelujah? That's amazing. That's who, that's who he's praying to. Not only in this world, but the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church, and the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. Amen. Amen. That's who Paul's praying to. Paul says, I bow my knees, and I'm speaking to the one who has named every family, who's created all. That's who I'm speaking to. And what's he praying? What's he praying? Wow. He says this. I pray that you would have inner strength through his spirit. I'm praying to the one who has unlimited resources that you would have inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down in God's love and keep you strong. See, I'm praying that you would be able in your inner self to have enough courage, have enough faith to be able to place your faith in Christ Jesus so that Christ will make his home in you. Now, for many who are, are debating this whole question of who God is, not really sure if they should place faith in him or not, they need us to pray for them. They need God's help to be able to place faith in him. And that's why Paul is praying this. I, I've, maybe you were one of these people. Uh, I was one of those people. I needed God's help to be able to place my faith in him. And we need to be diligent in praying for one another, praying for the lost, that they would be able to place faith in Christ so that Christ will make his home in their lives.
That, that is God's mission for us. So we need, to, we need to model what Paul is doing, praying that people would have this kind of faith. Christ, when we place faith in him, comes and moves in. He, he makes us his home. This is an incredible concept. That's what Paul is praying. Christ is not, doesn't become an occasional visitor uh, or, or a short-term rental. Uh, he does, he's not a charity case that we just kind of tolerate. But our, our, our body, our, our mind, our soul becomes his house. He chooses the paint. He arranges the furniture. He selects the dishes. He remodels the house, right? And he, he maintains the house. He puts down roots and creates an environment where we feel more at home than ever in his love. We are truly at home with him. That's the goal. Once we place faith, Jesus moves in. That's what Paul is praying. And then we become rooted into God's love. Our, our, our feeling of being at home is that we start, we start putting our roots down into him as he puts roots down into us. It says here that you would be rooted and grounded in God's love, that this would become the foundation of your entire life, that you would put down roots. Several years ago, I was uh, watching a dry riverbed. We can't, most of the time in Namibia, can't, can't watch flowing rivers, right? Every now and again, when a river flows, we get so excited because we never see it. Right? I heard that yesterday that the river is flowing in a sausage flag now. It's, it's, it's arrived. Isn't that cool? We were watching a dry riverbed one day, and uh, we saw that an acacia tree had sprouted up in the middle of this dry riverbed. I thought, well, that's interesting. And all of a sudden, we heard this roar. Have you ever seen this before? The beginning of a flow of a river in, in this country? It's one of the most incredible things. See this water, trickle of water coming down and down the river. It was amazing. We just watched as this, the water rose and rose and rose and rose. And all of a sudden, this acacia tree that was in the middle of this river was completely overwhelmed by the water. You couldn't see the top of the tree anymore. It just was so much water. As we stood there, we saw uh, kudu horns bouncing in the water through the river. I don't know if it was a, a living kudu or just take, going for a swim or... <laughs> or just, just horns. I thought, this is some powerful water. We were, it was at a lodge, and the next morning we got up and, and the waters had subsided. And you know what was still in the riverbed? The acacia tree. Rooted so, so deep that it was immovable. Paul says this. He's praying that our roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. When we root into God's love, we are kept strong. And he makes reference that we, we become people who are not blown around by all kinds of doctrine. E Ephesians 4, and I don't have it for you here on the PowerPoint, but he says this, that when we are rooted in God's love, we're not blown around uh, like children, children who are excited about whatever they see next. Have you ever seen kids like that? Whatever you have, they want. So if you pick out your smartphone, they want your smartphone. If you put your glasses on, they want to wear your glasses. He says, we are not like that when we're rooted in God's love. We're not chasing after every kinds of doctrine. We are rooted and, and solid in him. Paul also uses the idea of, of, of a ship. He says, we're not like a ship that's blown around, a, a, you know, a sailboat that's just blown around in the waters. We are, we are able to endure anything because we are rooted in his love. The key is to be rooted in his love. The doctrine of God, the theology of God, moves us to the love of God. And, and him moving in, we are, we are entrenched in his love in that relationship. Good doctrine, good theology leads us to an understanding of his love. And so we root into that, and we are not blown around. We are not distracted like children, rooted in God's love. On, uh, on Friday, um, we went to a memorial service for Jereen Rachels. Uh, I don't know if maybe some of you know Jereen Rachels. She was uh, a member of All Nations Church, and, but a friend of ours for, uh, I think, 25 years or more. I uh, just loved her very, very much, and uh, she passed away um, from cancer, and her service was yesterday. There's so many things you could say about Jereen, but um, 
the thing that, uh, uh, the highlight of her life was that she was rooted in God's love. And she was an example of this. Uh, before she died, uh, when, when she'd been, uh, right before she'd been diagnosed, but when she was feeling terrible physically and, and this went into an emotional pain and suffering, um, she, she wrote this about her journey with God. I've, I've printed it for you. This is something she wrote. She journaled a lot, and this is what she wrote. She said this, One of the greatest blessings that has come from this time is a depth of fellowship and intimacy with the Lord beyond anything I have ever known before. It has been a precious, sweet surprise on the journey. In the midst of so many hard things, I had to turn to him over and over in my weakness and ask for his grace and strength. He has given it willingly and has surrounded me with his love and comfort. This has been a treasure beyond anything I could ever have imagined. I'm not a masochist. I haven't enjoyed the trials, the suffering, but I wouldn't want to go back to how it was before in my walk with the Lord. This has been too great a treasure. I am profoundly grateful. God has surrounded me and carried me in ways I didn't even know were possible. I've learned that I don't need to fear what is ahead because God is greater than anything I may face. I don't know what's still ahead, so I cling to that truth even now. He will faithfully be with me in whatever is still to come. He is still God. Jereen fully understands now the incredible love of God. She is with him, experiencing this that she had her hope in before she left this place. She has fully understood, and now she fully understands. Oh, you know she's in a better place. The church really is made up of these kind of people who understand, who comprehend the height and breadth and depth of God's love, and they've experienced it. Paul continues in Ephesians 3, verse 18. He says, May you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to understand fully, then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Power to understand. It says here, I want you to understand, as all of God's people should. There's this expectation that as a child of God, you need to understand how deeply God loves you. That's how it makes sense. That's how this life is full and meaningful is when you understand and experience the full breadth of God's love. So, why is Paul falling down on his knees, prostrate before the Father? Why is he so grateful? Why does he want people to understand the love of God? Because of his own experience. If you look earlier before this passage, also in Ephesians 3, you can see this explanation of, of just how great and how amazing God's love is for this reason. And that's why he's praying. He said, I, want, I don't want you to miss out on this incredible love. He explains it in detail. I'm going to give you just some bullet points here and help us understand what Paul was so excited about. Why, in the middle of his suffering, he was still, still intimate with God. Why he was begging God for the souls of others so that they would experience what he had experienced. You can look at Paul's life again. I just want to remind you. You can look at Paul's life and you can say, he's in prison. He's suffering. What's he so happy about? What's he so proud of? Well, he's, he's, he has been encompassed by the love of God. And in that place of suffering, he is experiencing the sweetness of relationship with God. And so he's okay. He's more than okay. And he's driven and compelled and wanting others to experience this as well. Ephesians 3 says this. When I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ... Jesus, for the benefit of Gentiles, assuming, by the way, you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. As you read what I've written, you'll understand my insight into the, his plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit, he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. And then the verse that you have on here, and this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body, and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. 
This is what he's excited about. He's saying God's love is so incredible that it passes through uh, racism. It, it passes through color of skin, culture, and everything, and makes us all one. This was a phenomenal thought that regardless of who we are, that God loves past anything. He loves past our particular prejudices and loves all people. This is the mystery of God. This is what he's excited about. This is the love of God, that he loves us while we were still sinners. He loved us regardless of what we look like. He loves us regardless of where we come from. He loves us regardless of the culture we embrace. He loves us regardless of the political leanings we have. He loves us regardless of what social, social economic place we fit into society. He loves past our racism. He loves past our levels of society. This was incredible that all of a sudden in his world, the Gentile and the Jew were treated the same way. He explains this in Ephesians 2. Look at Ephesians 2.14. For, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles, people who hated each other, into one people, when in his body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. This is a radical kind of a love that transcends all of our hate. That's what he's amazed by. That the love of God is for all people, regardless. And that those people who've been transformed by him become one family. People who hated each other now love each other and worship together. What an amazing God we have. That's what Paul is saying. God's love is so wide, so depth, that it, it can transcend all of our hate and make people who never got along all of a sudden become family. I love New Song Family Church because of all the colors of people, all the languages here. I do believe this is just a glimpse of what God was talking about, that we together worship and we consider each other family even though we're from so many different backgrounds. But in Christ, we are a new nation, right? We are together someone new. And that's, that's the beauty of the gospel. And that's what Paul was excited about. He goes on, Ephesians 3, 7, By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving by spreading the news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. Paul has been so transformed by God that he counts it a privilege to represent him. For him, it was this byproduct that God's love propelled him, compelled him to be a person, an evangelist, who gladly shares the gospel, wants everyone to know. Paul, who killed Christians, has now been recruited by God to become a light to the world. You understand, Paul was a terrorist. <laughs> he was the last person I would have chosen to become a missionary. Jesus blinds him with light and says, why are you persecuting me? And calls him to himself. Paul is aware here, although he's in prison, after all these years of ministry, he's still remembering how God loved him, even though he didn't deserve it at all. The one who used to kill Christians is now the one who's spreading the message of God. And he's so grateful. He's so aware of it. Ephesians 3 verse 13 says, So please don't lose heart because of my trials. I'm suffering for you, so you should feel honored. He says, Don't feel sorry for me here in prison. You should feel honored. I'm doing this for you. He, he counted it a privilege. A privilege. The undeserving Paul counts it a privilege to still be this voice and witness for God. None of us deserve the wonderful gift of salvation, right? Not a single one of us. It's a wonderful gift. When you understand and experience God's love, you're aware of just how much you don't deserve his love. When you get closer to him, you realize how undeserving you are. But this free gift is so incredible. Paul counts it an honor to suffer for the sake of the gospel, the privilege of service. I want to just give you a snippet of... of uh, parts, uh, parts of a letter that he wrote to Corinthians just to give you an idea of, of how crazy Paul was. 
how excited he was for God. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. Paul's out there sharing the gospel, and obviously the Corinthians thought he was a little crazy, a little mad. So that if it seems we are crazy, <laughs> it, it's to bring glory to God. And, and if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love does what? Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old self. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Paul, who understood the breadth and depth, the length of God's love, is just crazily, passionately sharing this truth with a lost world. From, from a killer to an evangelist is what happened with Paul. And he counts it a privilege. I believe with all my heart that if you have been overwhelmed by God's love, if you've understood and experienced the love of God, the natural byproduct of your life is going to be that you're going to want everyone to know about it. You will share about what you love. You will. I'm telling you, when I first met Dana, and I started falling in love, man, I wanted everyone to know about it. Man, I am so in love. I remember when DV8 first met his bride. Man, he was telling everybody. Remember that DV8? Yeah. <laughs> so excited. We've experienced God's love. It's just overwhelming. We are, we are compelled. We are driven by love. A church that understands the comprehensive, exhaustive love of God wants everyone to know about it. I believe that church leaders could, could crack a whip in front of you and say, get out there and share the gospel. And you, you might think it's a good idea, but you still wouldn't do it. I think you need to understand and comprehend, experience the love of God before you are going to be motivated to share with others. May we comprehend, may we understand fully the love of God so that can become our passion. Ephesians 3, verse 9, he says, I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. What else is he excited about? Is that this good news of the gospel had been kept secret until his generation. What an amazing thing. He's saying he was aware. He probably had relatives uh, that he knew who had not heard about this Jesus, had not seen Jesus, who had not experienced this good news of the gospel. So he was clearly aware of those who had not received the secret, who had not had the privilege of their eyes being opened by Jesus, compared to himself who had experienced this incredible news. Paul's generation was chosen for the Messiah to be revealed. And he's saying here, wow, we are so privileged that it was exposed, this secret was actually shared with us. By the way, we are still in this incredible blessing where the truth of the gospel is still made aware for us. How incredible that in our generation we get to know and experience the Messiah. God's purpose for all of this is that the church would display his wisdom in its rich variety. Look at Ephesians 3, verse 10. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, this, these two verses here very often are confusing to people. Uh, who are we a display for? The church becomes this glorious witness to not just those that we can see, but the unseen world. That's what he's saying here. God's comprehensive love is a witness to not just the seen world, but to the unseen world. I'm going to explain this to you. Who are these principalities and powers that Paul is talking about? Paul is talking about the demonic, right? This other spiritual world that we do not see. And he's saying the church is actually a witness and testimony to them. 
Now, it's possible this morning that we don't believe in these principalities or powers because we can't see them. Just wonder a few things to help you understand that these principalities and powers do exist. There's a few things that we count on in life that we can't see, right? Your brain. Have you ever seen your brain? It is there, right? Your heart. Have you ever seen your heart? I hope you still have one. We depend on these. We know they're there. We feel them, right? We experience them. This is true with the unseen rulers of this world, the demonic. They impact our lives even though we can't see them. We see later in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 6, where he says, put on the spiritual uh, armor. Because our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but what? The unseen spirits. He's saying, so the church, us, the fact that the church has been transformed and overwhelmed by his love is a living example, not just to the seen, but to the cosmos, to the world, to the unseen, that he changes lives. Before any one of us writes off the demonic as this pre-scientific mythology, think again. Is it real evidence or is it just a, a pervasive mood of secularism that makes Satan and his host unpalatable to us modern folk? Have all, have all our modern scientific advances given us a handle on the evil forces in the world? Have all of our inventions, all of the great things we've created kept us from evil? It's actually the opposite has taken place, right? The cosmic forces of evil managed to get a handle on every human invention and every human institution and corrupt them and turn them for destruction. Let me think about it with me just for a moment. If you wonder if the unseen forces are active in our world today, let's just take nuclear power, for example, right? Now, for decades, nuclear power, instead of being an energy source, has been the basis of international braggadocia, right? And mutual threats of national suicide. We're going to we're going to kill you with an atomic bomb. The multi-purpose petroleum industry becomes the currency of international blackmail, right? Pain-relieving drugs become a multi-billion dollar market in life-destroying narcotics. Advances in obstet obstetrical science serve to refine the technique of manslaughter through millions of abortions. New inventions such as computers and smartphones have now become the tools to save us time. No, but for many, instead of freeing them up, they become slaves, never leaving the side of their media. We are able to communicate more than ever before, but we are feeling more alone than ever. Let's pause for a moment just to acknowledge that these unseen forces are penetrating all of our institutions, our inventions, the creativity of mankind, and has entrapped us, hasn't helped us for the most part. It's been used for evil. I think all of these inventions can be used for good. But we see the presence of this unseen in the lives of the seen on a daily basis. Matter of fact, uh, Paul mentioned, this says, you once were these children of disobedience. You once were these people who followed the principalities of the unseen world. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says that, that these unseen spirits are working in the sons of disobedience, he says, and then are creating problems. So we are impacted every single day, all of us, by these unseen rulers and authorities that are working in the lives of people. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ comes and makes his home with us. We are freed from these unseen rulers. Our lives transform. We start living, truly living. We root into his deep love, and our lives are transformed. Paul says here, that collection of people whose lives have been transformed, those children of God become the church. The church then becomes this, the, the, the example of, to the seen and to the unseen of who he is. Whether we realize it or not, we become a testimony to the seen and the unseen of God's extraordinary love. Amen? Wow. 
And we, we become this stirring example of, of, the, of the, the rich variety of God's wisdom, as Paul puts it here. He says, we become this amazing, colorful uh, example. That's the terms he used here. This, in, in Ephesians 3, uh, verse 10, he says, God's purpose in all this was to use her to display his wisdom in, his rich, in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers. That basically, we dazzle the unseen rulers and worlds by God's wisdom. So look, and how, do we, how does he do that? Because the unseen world sees the transformation in our lives. They see that we're better people. They see, wow, this is wise. You mean Jews and Gentiles get along now? They love each other? All different types of colors of people are in one place, and they actually care for each other, their family? This is amazing. That displays the colorful wisdom of God. Like a beautiful bouquet of flowers with all different types of flowers in this huge vase, you see the beauty of God. And the church is this beautiful picture of God's wisdom that he loved us when we did not love ourselves. He came to us when we were still sinners, and he saved us and transformed our lives. And he made his home. Wow, God is wise. God loves. And we become this amazing testimony to the seen and the unseen of God's wisdom, the powerful wisdom of God. How does he do it? We just are an example to a lost world to say, hey, it, you know, God really works. This works. <laughs> God breaks down the walls of hostility and he, he makes people who hated each other one. Love is the key. Rooted in God's love. Rooted in his transformative power. This is what Paul is falling down on his knees and begging that people would understand it. It means the world, everything to Paul, love. The core rooted in God's love. It's no surprise then that when you look in the book of Revelations chapter 2, when, when God sends a letter to the church of Ephesus, this same church, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't warn them about anything but the fact that they've lost their first love. So my problem with you is you've lost your first love. You don't love each other. You don't love me. And he says you're going to be disqualified. This is in Revelation chapter 2. I don't have it here for you. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. It's just this expression of God saying, this is where you blew it. Even, he goes on to say, says, your doctrine is amazing. You have great doctrine. You correct people who are wrong. Well done. But you've lost your first love. You don't love each other. You don't love me and you're about to be disqualified. Not because of your doctrine. Not because of your theology, but because you've missed the boat about love. You fail to, again, to experience and comprehend the depth of God's love. Our lives are basically disqualified when we don't comprehend, experience the love of Christ. Those who understand and experience the love of God know what life is really all about. A full and meaningful life is only possible when we place faith in Jesus and then begin to understand and experience the exhaustive love of God. Ephesians 3, verse 19, may you experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to understand fully, then you'll be made what? Complete. In all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. You want a full and meaningful life? Place faith in Jesus Christ. Allow Christ to make his home in you. And then put your roots in his love. Be founded in his love. And you will be an immovable rock. You will not be blown around back and forth. You'll be solid. You'll know. The letter of Ephesians is, is such a great letter to give practical helps. We're not going to spend time this morning of all the different ways, but just to give you a little snippet, a little heads up. This love of Christ impacts our marriages. He gives instruction there on how to be married, how to talk to each other and speak the truth in love, how to serve out of this passion. He says, because of God's love, strip from yourself all the former nature. In other words, live right. 
It says, become useful in the kingdom. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, compassionate. This is all in the letter of Ephesians. But it's this incredible demonstration, this byproduct of, of us understanding the love of God. My prayer for you and for me is that as you fully understand this love, that you too, that we all will bow our knees, that we'll fall flat on our face and, and beg God for the souls of those who don't know him. When we fully understand and experience the love of Christ, we become these prayer warriors who beg God that he would transform others. Oh, Lord, help us to be those kinds of people. Lord, that we would fully understand the depth, the breadth, the height of God's love. Oh, Lord, help us to understand. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we praise you. We love you. Lord Jesus, you have loved us when we were nothing. While we were still sinners, you came to us. And Lord, you made us something. Lord, we praise you for making your home in us. Lord, we praise you for the, the life examples, the saints who've gone before us, Doreen Rachels, who, who lived this passionate love for you and was transformed by your love. Lord, we praise you that she's with you now. And Lord Jesus, I pray, God, that you would break our hearts this morning for those in our community, in our families, who have not experienced this love. Lord, may we, Father, be inspired and motivated to, to fall before you and, and beg you for their souls. Lord, transform us by your love today. In your name I pray. Amen.